Good evening and welcome to another webinar presented by the Miami University Alumni Association. I'm Michelle Rosecrans here with Dr. Sandra Garner tonight. We are here for Objects That Change the World, Earthworks, um, which is a part of the Objects That Change the World series. We're doing that in partnership with the Miami University Humanities Center. Um, this is eighth in a series of nine webinars. And uh, if you'd like to view any of the previous ones that have been done in this series, you can um, uh, find those on the same website you're on tonight. Um, Dr. Garner is an Associate Professor of Global and Intercultural Studies at Miami University and the Coordinator of American Studies. She's developed an interactive and long-term research partnership with the Eastern Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma. Dr. Garner is a past Heenan Wilkins Fellow at Miami University, a recipient of the National Endowment of the Humanities Summer Stipend Award, and was an Altman Scholar in 2013-2014 with the topic globalization and belonging and also in 2020-21. Um, we will be taking questions tonight. You just click the link underneath uh, the, the visual uh, to submit your question and those will be relayed to Dr. Garner at the end of the session. Um, we may not have time to get to every single question but we'll do our very best. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Garner. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you, Michelle. And I wanna thank the Miami Alumni Association and the Miami University Humanities Center for this invitation to present tonight on objects that change the world. And um, this portion of the series is funded by the Friends of the Humanities and to celebrate the role of the humanities at Miami University and really in the modern world that we live in today. It's a very important part that enriches our experience of this world. So this is sponsored by the Friends of Humanities and I'll have a slide at the end of the presentation. You know, every donation helps with keeping the humanities alive. And this is a particularly rich humanities program that we have here at Miami University. And whether it's a dollar or, or a sponsorship, it helps fund um, scholarly activities, fellowships, student work, etc. So I encourage you to contribute to that effort. So I'm gonna share my slides now and start talking about the presentation on the earthworks. All right, so objects that change the world. And you might be thinking tonight, as I say, earthworks, you might say, earthworks, earthworks change the world. How have the earthworks changed the world? They're not something like the first, the invention of the automobile or the first flight with the Wright brothers or porcelain or the pill, I get it. It's something that's different, but I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, I will have persuaded you that the earthworks, in particular, the Newark earthworks, are worthy of our attention, consideration, and contemplation. So the map that you see here is a render, an, an artist rendering of surveys that were done in the 1850s by Ephraim Squire and Edward Edwin Davis. And they were in the early field of archeology, span which I'll talk about a little bit more later on. But right now I really just wanna orient you to this site that is in Newark, Ohio, just 30 miles east of Columbus. And think about the geometric patterns at this earthwork site and keep in mind the orientation. Today, these sites, the octa, we call this the octagon and the small circle and the great circle still remain after 2000 years. Unfortunately, 
settlement in the area has knocked down a large portion of the square. So the Newark earthworks, you may have heard about them or read about them recently um, because they're in the news a lot. There are, are a group of stakeholders that came together in 2006 to begin an extensive proposal to nominate the newer earthworks as part of a package referred to as the Hopewell Ceremonial Sites for approval as World Heritage Sites. So World Heritage Sites are managed by UNESCO, which is a branch of the United Nations that deals with education, science, and culture. And some of the greatest wonders of the world that we think of, the pyramids, Stonehenge, Easter Island, Machu Picchu, which you see in this slide, they're sites that we're very familiar with. And the stakeholders in this nomination process believe that New Work Earthworks deserves to be in that category. The process, once you submit an application, is really lengthy. It takes somewhere between 15 and 20 years. Um, it goes through the Department of Interior in the US, and then it's nominated to UNESCO, and then it's put on a accepted or not for a short list. And only two or three sites every year achieve World Her Heritage status. So this combination, this Hopewell Ceremonial Sites package includes the Newark Earthworks, Fort Ancient, and Hopewell Culture National Park Systems. And there's another package that is being nominated as well that includes, for example, Serpent Mound. But today I'm just going to talk about the Hopewell Ceremonial Sites. So there are a lot of current stakeholders in this nomination. Um, I had the benefit, I take students abroad frequently and we go to Paris and then when we were in Paris, we always um, take a site visit to UNESCO World Heritage Center and everybody there knows about the Newark Earthworks, which is kind of surprising because there are people that live 10 miles away from the Newark Earthworks that don't know about it. But on a federal level, this these sites have already been um, approved as National Historic Landmarks. They're on the short list for the Department of Interior to be moved forward in the process. They, at a state level, they're the official prehistoric monument in Ohio. Academics, not just at Ohio State University and University of Cincinnati, but I do work on the earthworks. A lot of academics from our public institutions in Ohio are very invested in this nomination. We also have businesses that are current stakeholders, the Ohio Historical Society, and forgive me because I'm gonna go back and forth with the name here because they've recently been renamed as the Ohio History Connection. So sometimes I'll say Historical Society, sometimes History Connection. The Licking County Convention and Visitors Bureau and the Mound Builders Country Club are all stakeholders in this process. And then we have concerned citizens from Newark and beyond, um, especially like the nonprofit group Friends of the Mounds, and then various Native American tribes that have lived in the Ohio region. So this is a picture of Chief Glenna Wallace. She's quite a dynamic lady. She was the first woman ever elected chief in um, for the Eastern Shawnee tribe of Oklahoma. And she, since she began her term as chief three terms ago, 12 years ago, has been in the forefront of the movement to not to achieve this status for Newark Earthworks as a World Heritage Site. She says, World Heritage recognition for the earthworks and full public access would play a crucial role in reframing the way visitors think about Native Americans. 
The sophistication required to create this shows my ancestors weren't savages. This needs to be open to people every single day of the week, every single day of the year. And this was in an interview that she gave to the New York Times just a week and a half ago on April 12th. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the importance of mound building to the indigenous cultures in what we think of it today as North America and in particular the United States. And this was a very prevalent practice among the original inhabitants, building mounds, different kinds of mounds. And this map will give you a sense of how many mounds were just in Ohio alone. Every little red dot you see here is a mound in Ohio. So this is a very prevalent practice east of the Mississippi. There's some west of the Mississippi in the northern part um, at the mouth of the Mississippi, but most of this is east of the Mississippi and is through what I really divide between a southern style and a northern style. And that is to say, in the southern style, we refer to the mounds as being Mississippian cultures. Um, that's just a term given by archaeologists to them, and they have a different formation. And those cultures have even retained and today still build mounds in their new homelands in Oklahoma. So, for example, the Muskogee Creek build mounds as part of their ceremony and social practices. In the northern part of the today U.S., we have what archaeologists have divided into really five different eras that they talk about starting in about 10,000 to 14,000 years ago to first contact. Now, we know that archaeologists and anthropologists like to talk about this as being prehistoric, but I'm going to use that in scare quotes, meaning that prehistoric before the arrival of Europeans to this land. So native cultures, indigenous cultures did record keeping in different ways that may not be legible to us today, but they certainly have their own history as well. So starting from the earliest to the present, the, these different cultural eras, the Paleo-Indian, the Archaic, the Early Woodland, the Middle Woodland, and the Late Woodland, takes us up pretty close to the time of contact. These, especially the Early Woodland and the Middle Woodland, are referred to frequently as the Adena and Hopewell. And I frequently have people ask me, what do you know about the Adena Indians? Or what do you know about the Hopewell Indians? Well, I just want to remind you that those indigenous peoples did not refer to them as the Hopewell or themselves as the Hopewell or Adena. Those are just names that archaeologists have given to these culture groups based on really where the first artifacts were that they found. So I know that the Hopewell culture group, the Middle Woodland, the first artifacts that they deem as being different from the, their predecessors, the Adena, and in the shape and the way that they were made and formed, were found on a farmer's land, and his last name was Hopewell. Thus, we call it the Hopewell era. So in the northern part of the U.S., um, which will be what my focus is for the rest of the talk, there, we really find three different mound, types of mounds. And the first is the conical. This is a picture of Miamisburg Mound that's right outside of Dayton. Then we see a series of what we call effigy mounds. So they're shaped like various animals, or they may be archetypal figures. Um, for the indigenous inhabitants. And then the third type are these geometric mounds. And these are not filled in like the conical mound that's filled in. The effigy mounds is all a mound. 
in what we see in these geometric mounds are just the outline of the geometric shape is a mound. So I'm going to spend some time here specifically on the New Work Earthworks. And we refer to this as a type of monumental architecture. That really means that if you're on the ground and you were just go think, imagine the first Western or European settlers to this area and they come and they see these big hills of dirt, but they can't really see what they look like overall. They were built really to be seen from above. So you can think of them as um, being native knowledge written on the land for the heavens. And you can see that in this aerial view of the Newark Earthworks ceremonial complex, where you can clearly distinguish the octagon, two parallel walls, a small circle and a great circle. And this is the, the square that I was saying has been destroyed by um, settlement. This comprises a four square mile area. So when you go to Newark, Ohio today, like you, you go to the great circle and you're like, oh, where's the octagon? Well, you have to get back on the expressway, drive a few miles, get back off the expressway in Heath and um, then you're at the great circle. So we, the first site you come upon going east would be the octagon. These are huge in size. I, I mean, I cannot even describe if you've not been there. The octagon shape itself encloses 50 acres. The small circle, 20 acres, and the larger, the great circle, what we refer to it today as, is 30 acres. So these are huge sites. They're made solely of earth. And we know from archaeological digs that that earth was gathered from different locales around the area. And so they're different colored earths. And if you took a cross section of a mound, you would see a layer of one color of earth, another layer of another color, another layer of another color, going from river clay to sandy, more loam-like soil. The height of the walls, and I'm talking now particularly about the octagon, are very interesting because they range from about two feet tall to about six feet tall. But if you were looking at them across the top, they would all look to be the same height. That's because they're built to account for the rolling layout of the land. So we see wall heights in the octagon as being two to six feet. Sorry about that, sensitive mouse. And on the great circle, they're much taller. And there is, inside the great circle, there's a, a shallow ditch that's dug all the way around the inside of the circle. Not enough to build the mounds of that type. So they carry the earth in and built by hand these mounds. The other important thing that we know about these sites is that when they were originally built and used by indigenous peoples, that they didn't allow trees to grow within the perimeter of the site. We see here, this is um, the octagon now, we see trees here but that did not happen for the indigenous people. And the inside was planted by um, grass from the plains. So they seeded this area to have a certain kind of grass there, no trees, because that would obstruct your view of what's going on at the site. And the other interesting fact is that there is no visible sign, at least from material culture, of habitation. So a lot of times famous sites, like we think of Machu Picchu in South America, th there's indication that there were settlements there and people living there, or even Sunwatch Village in Ohio. 
So, but that's not the case at Newark, which makes it an interesting mystery to kind of grab our attention. So while we consider what kind of effort it takes to lay out and build from dirt these mound structures, we also need to consider what we understand now is that this, especially the octagon, is an observatory for the movement of the moon. So we see this again in lots of cultures across the world where landscapes are created to monitor and track, for example, the sun. We know Stonehenge is built so that you, in a certain kind of viewpoint, you see the rising and setting of the sun on the winter solstice and the summer solstice. We know, for example, that the serpent mound is laid out in that way. But the octagon is very interesting because it is an observatory for the moon and moon risings and moon settings. So we think about, when we think about the um, rotation of the sun, you know, it's a year, one year. You can watch it a couple of years in a row, you get the idea that you're seeing a cycle. But the lunar cycle at 18.6 years, that's a lot of very close observation and you have to do it multiple times. But this side is laid out. So on the day, or it's actually a period of about two or three days when the moon rises at its northernmost position in the sky, you can stand, this is probably the better viewpoint, this is called Observatory Mound. That's what we call it today. You can stand here. You can line it up, your sight, with the two parallel walls connecting the circle and the octagon. And at the tip of the octagon, which we can see here, you see the moon rise. Throughout this 18.6 year cycle, there are eight standstill points. So as the moon moves from northernmost rising down to the southernmost rising. There are eight times during that period that it stops for a couple of days and stays in that position. Each point of the octagon is a site point for these eight standstill points. So they were very, very intently focused on their relationship and monitoring and watching the moon. And the octagon is a very interesting shape. All these other geometric shapes, when we think of mounds like the circle, even a square, we think about the pyramids and triangles are based on shapes that we see in nature. But that's not the case here. There is no octagon in the natural world and natural environment. And there's a relationship between this octagon complex and the great circle, the way that it's laid out and the direction it faces on the land. But if you draw a straight line from Newark down to Chillicothe, Ohio, those sets of mounds lay in exactly the same direction and layout. So we know that there is a geometric relationship between the mounds in Newark and between Newark and the mounds in Chillicothe. So we call these ceremonial sites because there is a preponderance of evidence that um, they were used for multiple ceremonial purposes. And the first example I'd like to give you is what we call the Hopewell Interaction fear, Sphere. So there are artifacts that have been found in the Newark earthworks that come from all over the continental United States. There is copper. This is one of the copper artifacts found that comes from one of the upper lakes, Great Lakes. There is um, mica that comes from the 
South Carolina, North Carolina area. There are conch shells that come from the um, Gulf of Mexico. What's interesting about this is you could interpret it as a trade route and people are trading goods, but at the other sites, at these other locations, we don't see goods that are made in from this area. And there are some, for example, Flint Ridge has a particular kind of flint that people would come from all over the continental United States to quarry. But we don't see the same preponderance of flint points around the rest of the continent that we see in at the Hopewell ceremonial sites. One of the most famous of these is what has been named the Ray figurine. Some people call it the shaman of the sh shaman of Newark. And it's a small figurine that has a person that has this bear skin over the top and on the lap is a bag beaded bag and it's built from clay and we can see this exact same sort of cultural practice in present day indian communities at powwows and a, a very prominent regalia a special prominent regalia is the bear skin the third and final thing that I want to point out is what we call, I talked about this direct route from Newark to Chillicothe. So we have sided mounds that create kind of the edges of roads, almost the entire length of this route, which is approximately 70 miles. So the current interpretation, which is pretty valid, I think, is that this was a ceremonial road or what we call a pilgrimage road, that people would take pilgrimages from Chillicothe to Newark. And there seems to be areas that there are four standstill points here. And these are wide like avenues. It's not like um, a little path through the woods where we see evidence of this road, it can be six to eight feet wide from one mound to the other. So we have this rich evidence of cultural, of material culture that comes from the mounds, but we have at least in this Northern part of engagement, a, a very strong cultural discontinuity between the native, present day native peoples and these indigenous inhabitants of the past. And that is, I would argue, in large part due to the rapid movement of settlement as Europeans came to this continent and started moving westward across the continent. It was a little slow going at first because we had three imperial powers fighting over who's going to be in control of this land. But once the American Revolution takes place, that rapidly changes. But during from first contact until the American Revolution, we see a lot of the um, population being decimated by diseases. We also, there was a period of time when the Iroquois Nation, which is up in Northern New York State present day, and on the what we think of as the Canadian border today, they were allies with the French and the French gave them rifles and they were the first community of indigenous people to get that kind of weapon. And so they did raids down along the Great Lakes into the Ohio area. By the time we get to the American Revolution, we see there are lots of Indian communities in Ohio. 
um, one famously the Lower Shawnee Town that is right here along the Ohio River. But these communities were really more akin to being refugee camps than they were as um, permanent settlements. So, for example, Lower Shawnee Town, we can clearly associate that with the Shawnee, was also home to the Wyandotte, the Delaware, the Miami, and the Ottawa. So we saw during that period, lots of little communities and villages set up where different tribal peoples were coming together to really collaborate in order to survive. So I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on Indian removal from Ohio. It was once the U.S. was formed and founded, it was a pretty rapid process. Um, the first major ordinance was the Ordinance of 1787, and that kind of set the Ohio River as the boundary. But there was settlement into that area was allowed, but there were areas that native peoples were supposed to be able to hunt and live without interference from settlers. Quickly, that didn't last long. And by 1795, we had the Treaty of Greenville, which moved this border from the Ohio River to this northern portion of Ohio. And all of the native peoples were removed to this area. And we see as we learn the history, of, for example, of the Miamia, they end up here in Northern Indiana. By, at that point, 1795, you've only got a small portion of Ohio that has native people still left. And we see then the city of Newark is founded in 1802 our own university, Miami University, is founded, what, in 1803, 1804? State of Ohio becomes, Ohio becomes a state rather than a territory. And there were still, though, some Native peoples living north of this treaty line from the Greenville Treaty. And by 1815, um, they put them on what they called reserves. And there were three reserves, the Hog Creek Reserve, the Wapakoneta Reserve, and the Lewistown Reserve. And those are really the reserves that housed primarily Shawnee people. That only lasted from 1815 to 1830. So I'd like to transition a little bit as we're getting there, 1830, 1840s, the Indian Removal Act is removing all Indian peoples west of the Mississippi River. Settlement is going in earnest in uh, east of the Mississippi. And this is also the period of time where archeology span moves from being really kind of a hobbyist experience to being solidified as a, an academic discipline and based on science. So we see really almost the heartland in the US of where this happens is this area around Columbus, Newark, Granville, because there were so many mounds in these areas and people were digging into them, sometimes for profit, because they were so loaded. It was almost like they were seeded with artifacts. There were so many there. And so it, this became a really booming business for the hobbyist. And they could buy. There were lots of collectors of Indian artifacts by this point. They would dig, dig into these mounds like we see here and gather artifacts and sell them on the market. It's still a pretty um, booming market on in the black market today. But we also have people going back to that first slide, like Squire and Davis, who are going and they're serving the mounds, they're doing 
layouts of all the mound structures, how they relate to each other. And they end up publishing their work called Ancient Monuments in 1848. And they become the first publication of the Smithsonian. And we see then this connection between archaeology as being professionalized and based on science and the emergence of the Smithsonian institutions. So then, then what happens? You know, people are moving in, towns are growing, etc. But the size and um, of the earthworks, it was just an astounding thing to see. And so for the most part, people in Newark didn't bother them except for that one little square area. And they knew that they were something special, something important. And so several people put their funds together and they bought the Great Circle in 1853. And they were investors and the land had been under private ownership. I think there were four owners when they made the purchase in 1853. And they proceeded to utilize the site for a variety of uses over the next really 50, 60 years. Um, in 1854, it was the site of the Ohio State Fair. By 1861, it was a training ground for the 76th Regiment of the Army of the Northern Army in the Civil War. And they were so, the regiment was so taken by the site that after the war was over, the remaining members of the 76th would return regularly for reunions at the Great Circle. In 1890, it became a public park for the citizens. And you could see during this like 1880s, 1890s, used for all different sorts of purposes. So one of them was Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show came to Newark, Ohio and performed inside the Great Circle. At one point, it was set up as a racetrack for the citizens. In 1898, Somebody used it as an amusement park and created an amusement park there. And finally, when we get to the early 20th century, these the owners, this ownership consortium deeds the property to the county, to Licking County. And by the time the Great Depression hits, really Licking County can't keep up keep the upkeep of the site and they deed the site to the Ohio Historical Society or what we know as the Ohio History Connection. The Octagon took a little bit longer. It was under private ownership until the 1890s and the citizens of Newark decided they wanted to preserve this site and they proposed and passed a tax levy to purchase it from the individual ownership who had been in charge. And um, they put in charge to manage the site, this group called the Newark Board of Trade. And this was a private group that acted as a chamber of commerce for the city of Newark. And then for the next 15, 14 years, the National Guard was brought in every summer for training to the Octagon. It brought tourism dollars into Newark. So the Newark Board of Trade really looked like they were doing their job. There were 7,000 people coming in every summer. And eventually they end up deeding the property again with the package with the Great Circle to Ohio History Society in 1933. But there's a little bit of a hiccup with the octagon. In 1892, when the octagon is first purchased, that's the same year that the very first golf course comes to the U.S., is built in the U.S. 
and the Newark Board of Trade were businessmen. They were very interested in golf. Golf and business are kind of associated in the American imagination. And so they started plans almost immediately to use this site as a golf course. By 1910, they had built first a nine hole golf course, then an 18 hole golf course, and um, built a country club building on the site. This really caused a lot of uproar with the citizens of Newark, Ohio, who had spent their tax dollars to buy the site so they could take their families for picnics on Sunday and go stroll around the grounds. Suddenly, there's a golf course there. And it's not really probably too surprising that the majority of the people who were members of the Newark Board of Trade were the initial, on the initial board of directors for the new Mound Builders Country Club. They leased the Board of Trade, leased the site to the Country Club in 1910, and we are now a century later, and that continues to be an issue. So right now, the only thing standing in the way of this Hopewell Ceremonial Sites nomination as uh, World Heritage status is the fact that the golf course still is sitting and functioning on the octagon portion of the site. So it, it's a lease that's renewed periodically. Originally, they were like short-term, shorter-term leases, 20 years, 30 years. And for a long time, there was really no problem because, again, Ohio Historical Society didn't really have the funds for upkeep of the site. They weren't really sure what to do with it. The country club maintained the site beautifully. But about two decades ago, it became an issue. First, because the country club decided they were growing. They wanted to expand their clubhouse. And this is a picture of their clubhouse. But when they did site examinations, the Ohio History Society realized that they were going to have to do some damage to the mounds in order to expand the clubhouse. So they denied this request. And somebody knows, but nobody really knows, but suddenly in the 70s, a lease was signed between the Ohio Historical Society and the Mound Builders Country Club that extended their lease until 2078. So the country club has this size leased until the 2078 year. The UNESCO and the Bureau of Interior has told the people who have nominated the Newark Earthworks that. Um, they cannot proceed on this site until there is no country club or golf course sitting on it because you have to be able to maintain access to the site at all times. Right now, for the people of Newark, anybody who wants to go there and see the mounds, there are only four days, public days a year that you or I can go to the site and go look at it and walk it, et cetera. The Ohio Now History Connection has sued the country club and um, trying to assert eminent domain to get the club back because even though the Mound Builders Country Club says, ah, we'll move, we just have to have enough, you have to buy out our lease and it has to provide us with enough money to go someplace else and build a new country club there. But there's somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 million apart in what price they think that's going to take. So Ohio History Connection has sued the country club. Two lower courts in the um, state of Ohio have ruled in favor of the country club. And um, 
each time the country club appeals. And then last Tuesday on the 13th, the Ohio Supreme Court had took on the case to rule in regards to eminent domain. So as we stand now, we're still between a rock and a hard place, so to speak, about whether or not this site will become a world heritage site. So I really want to thank you for your attention. And um, here's some information about becoming a friend of the humanities. And I'm happy to take questions for the next 15 minutes or so that we have here. Well, Dr. Garner, um, I must confess, despite the fact that I'm your host this evening, I um, came into this with almost no knowledge of this topic. Um, I grew up in Georgia and I actually sent a note to um, my colleague during this and said, so you grew up in Ohio. Did you know about this growing up? Because there were similar sites in Georgia that I knew about as a kid um, from class trips and whatnot. So this is um, this is very dramatic for me. I said, what? Out loud several times, especially when you got to four days a year. I thought you were going to say four days a week that you could go to the site. So yeah. um, I do. And there's a little platform you can walk on up to the top of outside of the site and look over the site. Oh, my goodness. Trust me, you don't want to do that when golfers are golfing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I was not spoiled on this. There were no spoilers for me. And so I really didn't see the golf course part coming. So anyways, um, <laughs> came into this really unknown. But we do have some questions that came in that I'd love to relay to you. So okay, can I stop sharing? Or? You're good. You're fine now. We're actually, it's just the two of us on screen. Oh, um, okay. I yep. can't see you though, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> you can stop sharing, I believe, if you'd like to be able to see. Um, that's all right. So, um, so Constance Swank, class of 73, I'll just read her, um, her submission. She says, what a wonderful program, Dr. Garner. I grew up in Heath, which borders Newark on the south side, and some of the Newark earthworks are actually, I think, in Heath. We often visited Mound Builders Park when we were growing up, and even, I confess, walking on the tops of the earthworks. I am elated that this area is under consideration for a UNESCO designation. As we deal with racial injustice throughout our nation's history, your lecture reminds me that our birthplaces and hometowns reside on indigenous homelands. Are you able to make such links in your Miami courses, perhaps with colleagues in adjacent fields of study? Yes, I mean, I always try to talk about this in whatever American studies class when I'm giving mm -hmm. a survey of American studies, I always try to at least talk about this topic. And I'm actually teaching a class right now on American, Native American and Indigenous studies. And I most of those students had better be on this uh, webinar anyway. Um, <laughs> I try to make these connections. And I think that's really an important part because part of what happens with settler colonialism is what we talk about academically is the logic of elimination. So this kind of eliminating that connection between these original inhabitants and where we're at and where we're standing. And I think it's so cool that she was is from Heath and that she knew about it. I meet students all the time who are from Newark, Heath, and they're, they, they're not even aware that this exists in their own town. So it's pretty amazing. Thank you, Constance. So um, there was another question from Caitlin Rattleman, um, and Caitlin said, thinking of other um, existing and or potential UNESCO World Heritage Natural Sites, what is the discourse surrounding preservation, sustainability, and tourism with regard to Newark Earthworks? So this has been interesting, and sometimes I think, and thank you for the question, Caitlin, um, sometimes I think that, um, you know, right now businesses in Newark and the, are really like, yes, we need this status. We need to make this a world heritage site. That's going to bring all sorts of tourism into the area. But with that, if you've ever gone any place like Stonehenge, where you have to wait in a line of cars for three miles to even get to the site, you get on the site, 
you have to wait in lines to get close enough to take a picture, you realize that this is this can be helpful economically to a community. It can provide an, an identity for the community, but it really has to be undertaken with a lot of care in order to sustain and mm -hmm. not damage those sites. So thank you. Right. Um, so Virginia submitted a question and unfortunately I don't have a last name to share, but Virginia asked, so how did earthworks change the world? in the way that we know the pill and the automobile and um, air travel did. How do we situate this um, alongside those other um, world changing objects or things? Well, I think we changed the world by looking at the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at this kind of monumental architecture, I'll, I will be honest with you, I could not even draw, draw a perfect circle, but those huge circles that enclose 30 acres and 20 acres are perfect circles. Like when we see this sort of phenomenal um, engineering and the kind of brilliance behind this, it changes the way that we look at the original inhabitants of this land and this knowledge that people have had for a very long time. Good question, Virginia. So this is my own question. <laughs> so from Michelle. <laughs> um, so how did Squire and Davis ascertain that this area was something special? Um, and how much of the Newark Earthworks was even that obvious prior to aerial photography or just being able to get up in the air above it? When did people get a grasp on exactly what was there? Was it Squire and Davis or was it later on that it became a, a fuller appreciation? I think even before Squire and Davis. I, okay. I think when you come up to it, you might think, oh, it's just a hill. But mm -hmm. you realize that it's only probably two or three feet wide, mm -hmm. you're gonna climb that hill to see what it is. And then you see that it's marking a perimeter for a land. Mm -hmm. You realize there's something different there, right? And um, I forgot the first part of your question, but- No, oh, just oh, that, you know. So Davis, Edwin Davis was born and raised in Hillsborough, which of course is not very far from this. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, he was in, there are mounds all over that area too, right? Mm -hmm. Not the kind of um, as large as what we see at New York. Sure. But, he, but even as a young kid, he was exploring the mounds in his hometown. He got his degree at Kenyon College. And for his final mm -hmm. paper, um, he went out and kind of tried to survey the mounds mm -hmm. around that area. And one of the people who heard his paper was Daniel Webster, who took him under his wing and they worked out. And you gotta remember too, again, this was like archeology, span all the surveying had been a long, a fairly long practice. George Washington was a surveyor, right? They knew mm -hmm. they had the equipment for that. So this, volume by Squire and Davis really tries to lay out all of the mounds in Ohio. I think they did not succeed in that with some mm -hmm. of the smaller ones, but that's where we get that original map with the red dots on it okay. and from their work as well. So we've had a couple of questions about um, the ceremonial nature of the mounds. So Caroline Hobbenstricker um, asked about um, what sort of, what forms of ceremony would have occurred on the mounds um, and uh, how were they, how were the sites preserved before European settlement? And Janet submitted a question and um, it's more of a present tense question, so I'm not sure if she meant it in that way, but she asked of powwows, I, and I assume referring to in general, um, Native American ceremonies are ever held at the site. So, um, I guess in, in general, what can you tell us about, or what do we know about the ceremonial use of these sites? So for Caroline's part of the question and mm -hmm. about the ceremonial use, 
I think the artifacts and the types of artifacts that we find there, um, mm -hmm. are, they're not, this is really a kind of the fluorescence of cultural expression and material mm -hmm. culture. Like that mica hand, I don't know if you remember it from the very first one, mm -hmm. but in real life, I mean, it's almost two feet tall. Mm -hmm. Made out of mic, and you know, mic is just thin sheets of things. So, if, yeah. if somebody puts that kind of effort into something like that, there's a purpose and reason for it. It's not for use. And we know some of the sites were burial sites. We found mm -hmm. that in excavation. Some are not. Um, at the Great Circle, there's a mound in the near the center of it that we call Eagle Mound. Um, it's a, one of those effigy mounds inside the circle. And they have done extensive digs at that location and have found where remnants of what look like um, burial and there at that location. So, you know, we're taking what material culture we have and trying to build a story with that. Mm -hmm. As far as powwows, so as this process began um, for this nomination, we decided, because like you said earlier, Michelle, nobody knows about these places, you know? No, no, people mm -hmm. in Ohio don't know about them. So I was in graduate school at that point and worked at the Newark Earthwork Center and we did a variety of public programming, working with native tribes in the areas. And one year, what we did was a powwow there at the Great Circle. And um, another year, we brought in Aztec dancers from Mexico to dance there. Um, so every year, we tried to do something with indigenous peoples at the site in order to draw attention to it and think about the ways that it might have been used from what we know that ceremonially and Native peoples do today. Okay. Um, we have had a number more questions come in, so I'm going to try to get through these before we run out of time. Um, so George, um, I believe I'm going to pronounce it, I'm afraid wrong, but George um, Chiardi from Class of 89 actually submitted a question with uh, his registration and then another one here. So I'll, his first question was whether there are other earthworks out of, outside of North America or is it something unique to this continent? And then um, uh, a second question he submitted was that you mentioned they have found various artifacts around the mounds and what if anything has been found within the mounds themselves? So, um, so good question. Questions. <laughs> I, don't, I don't, so, there seems to be a certain kind of, um, and we didn't have cell phones and we didn't have Wi-Fi in those days, but there certainly seems to be almost a global cultural um, fluorescence that happens about 2000 years ago. We see, for example, the pyramids come at that time. So we see all kinds of, using the landscape and engaging the landscape for various purposes. Mounds like we see in North America and, that I've been talking about today, we don't see that so much, but we do see this impulse to really broadly ride on the land, almost like you're riding to the heavens, right? Mm -hmm. So like in South America, we see, um, I forget what the term of it is, but like these indentations that are carved in the landscape that make up effigies of animals, et cetera, that you don't mm -hmm. even know when you're on the ground what they are, but you have to see them again from the aerial view. So similar types of things, but not exactly like the earthworks here. And then the other question. is about artifacts being found within the mounds. So I, I both around mm -hmm. and so some of the burial sites that I was talking about, people were buried with probably what most likely were their most prized possessions, and we find lots mm -hmm. of projects in, in those areas. But even the smaller mounds around the areas, that's why it was such big business and, and still is today, kind yeah. of digging for and 
you go out and plow up your land to plant corn and you're going to find a lot of arrowheads, right? Sure. And people go out and take those and they collect them and they sell them on the market mm -hmm. illegally. I'll say again. <laughs> but, yes. 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 So um, Maggie, class of um, 2022, perhaps one of your students says, hi, Dr. Garner. Do you think it would be possible to sway the country club to even just expand public access to the site. Is there anything we can do as everyday people to advance this cause to preserve Ohio's earthworks? So I go back and forth between being very optimistic and very pessimistic about it. Probably at this point, our best, the best option is through legal means. And I think that since we've seen two lower courts um, decisions be on the side mm -hmm. of the Ohio History Connection, I think we're going to see that. I'm not sure, like, my ideas of how to remove the golf course is not, probably are not healthy ones, so <laughs> not pulling them up, but, but certainly it is a group of people sure. that, for play, are controlling a site that it would be um, a benefit to everyone. Indeed. Um, so write your congressmen, women, you know, get involved in politics, try to work with the Ohio history connection. I think mm -hmm. that we're, fi they're finally under a leadership that really understands the importance of this. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that, I mean, there's something really unsettling about, um, you go to the golf course and they're not supposed to like be walking on the mounds, but they have golf court, golf cart, little paths that cross over the mounds. Mm -hmm. If a, a golf ball lands in the mounds, they chip it out of there, right? So even having more access to it, I'm mm -hmm. not sure is enough. I don't think that's right. enough to gain world heritage status. Sure, that makes sense. So um, Kenny Stahl submitted the question of what is your personal favorite earthwork and why? <laughs> so I think the octagon is my favorite, which is hard to say because it's part of this whole complex. But um you know, a number of years ago when we began this nomination process, um, we did a walk, N Native peoples and academics and students, and we walked that great Hopewell Road from Chillicothe to the Newark Earthworks and did a ceremony there on one of their open days. And I think because of that, that's the one that it is probably holds my heart the most. You walk 70 miles, you're ready to, <laughs> that becomes your favorite, right? You're invested. <laughs> you're invested. So um, Janet Tipton asked a question and she's class of 79, um, whether the site has been examined um, by ultrasound or x-ray or something else like that. Yes, they're using right now the, that new, it's they call it light, LIDAR technology, L-I-D-A-R, mm -hmm. and I'm not an archaeologist, so I'm not, um, I'm not hip to all the most recent, but those are non, that's a non-invasive way, kind mm -hmm. of like an x-ray to examine these sites, mm -hmm. there have been a couple of people that have been very involved in that and publishing their work, so yes, that's one mm -hmm. way we've been learning about the sites. Okay. Um, and then uh, we'll just do two more questions. Um, this one is a, a sort of logistical question. Bob Coons asked, how was the earth actually moved to form the mounds? Um, how would Native Americans have moved that much earth? You mentioned it came from a lot of different places yeah. and different layers of earth there. I think that's a great mystery, Bob, <laughs> is my answer to that. I mean, what archaeologists will tell you is, you know, they were making baskets by that point, and mm -hmm. they were using shells, and they were traveling to these locations and filling up their baskets, digging the earth with shells, and carrying it back. That's almost unimaginable to me. Yeah. So 
how they did that, I don't know, but that's <laughs> that's the current theory in how that earth was brought back the way that it was. Okay. And then I think a nice question to end on. Jonathan, class of 2002, asked the question, um, are there similar Native American earthworks in Ohio or surrounding states that are uh, perhaps easier to visit and explore that you might suggest to our viewers tonight? Well, certainly the Great Circle is open and you can go there anytime you want. And it's a mm -hmm. lovely experience because since a lot of people don't know about it, it's not like overrun with people there. You can spend mm -hmm. a lovely day, day there. There's a nice little museum off to the side exploring that. Um, Serpent Mound is also a wonderful site locally. And then there are all sorts of mounds even going further south. So when I was making that kind of northern southern distinction, there are certainly mounds um, in Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, um, Poverty Point, which is, I want to say, Louisiana, is a huge, and they've already achieved world heritage status, by the way, because they don't have a golf course on them. So those are built more from the Southern kind of perspective, more pyramid-like. So they're all great. You, you could spend a whole summer visiting mounds, um, doing a road trip in your car. They're Not all great. For the kids who are a little bit tired of going to battlegrounds on family vacations, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, Dr. Garner, this has been um, so educational and enlightening, and thank you so much for your time um, that you've given uh, to prepare this presentation and present it. Um, I, based on the number of questions that have come in, I can tell that it really um, was meaningful to our viewers as well. So thank you so much. And thank you, of, of course, to the Miami University Humanities Center for partnering with the Alumni Association uh, for this um, series. Uh, I will conclude us there. If you have any final words, I want to give you a chance to say something. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to the Alumni Association and the Humanities Center at Miami. Wonderful. Well, thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. And again, you can view any of our past recordings um, at alumlc.org slash Miami OH. Um, and uh, it's there on the screen. And we look forward to seeing you uh, online again for our next webinar. Have a great evening. Love and honor.